afternoon and welcome to the NFF Connect series. Uh, my name is Ian Bennett. I'm the National Local Assistant State Team Coordinator for the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation. Uh, and tr truly appreciate everyone spending a few uh, minutes with us today to talk about another uh, event. Uh, a couple of ground rules with this. There will be no other videos. Myself and the presenter will be on and everyone will be muted uh, because of the number of people on right now. If you have a question or a comment, uh, the chat function at the bottom of your screen there will come to me. And if time permitting, we can get the, the, the questions into the presenter. So a little background on what we're doing. Uh, when a line of duty death occurs, uh, people experience in a department uh, expo emotions and experiences based on the position they're in. So the foundation created the uniform support groups, uh, which are fire chiefs, incident commanders, and company officers that have experienced a line of duty death and are available to help and trained and available to help other people uh, that experience this type of event. So very fortunate today, uh, we're debuting our company officer to company officer program. Um, now get Joe, Joe, we're ready. Uh, if you wanna start your video, there we go. We're very fortunate today uh, on our first company officer, we have uh, Joe Gapney, uh, he's a retired Lieutenant uh, from the Worcester, Massachusetts Fire Department. Worked there for 32 years, retiring from Rescue Company One. He was a member and instructor for the Worcester Fire Department Technical Rescue Team and a member of the group who founded the Worcester Firefighter Safety and Survival Seminars to honor fallen firefighters. So Lieutenant Gaffney, truly appreciate the, you taking the time and sharing your story with us today. So. Thanks, Ian. All right, a little bit about uh, what we're going to talk about today. On December 8th, 2011, at approximately 0421 hours, the Worcester, Massachusetts Fire Department was dispatched for a report of a fire in a triple decker. Uh, it's a residential structure, uh, three story residence. EMS crews on the scene report they are pulling a civilian from the structure with more civilians still inside on the second floor. Engine 12 arrives on the scene and reports heavy fire side Bravo and Charlie. While the rescue company was searching for trapped civilians, trapped civilians there's a structural collapse and members of the rescue company were trapped under the debris on the first fire on the first floor. Unfortunately, firefighter John Davies was killed in the line of duty. And that's the incident we're going to talk about today. So again, uh, Lieutenant Gaffney, truly appreciate you spending the time with us today and, and sharing your story. Most important thing, let's tell us about firefighter Davies. Who was he? What do you want people to know about him? Um, well, John was a John was a great guy. Um, I had, he had been on a rescue for about two and a half years at that point. Um, I, but I had known him previous to that. We were in the same group. Um, he was a single father of three sons. He had um, sole custody, did a great job raising his boys. Um, he had been the early part of his career, probably the first like maybe 10 years. He was on a very busy engine company downtown, Engine One. <clears throat> and then because of, you know, circumstances he transferred to engine seven which was outlying slow but it was close to his home because he was raising the three boys by himself he did the right thing as a family man um so you know on the weekends the kids would get out to the station and you know lift weights and play wiffle ball and hang out with their dad and uh, as the kids got older, well, actually, at the time of the fire, two of his boys were active duty military. And his youngest was in high school. So he was able to move on. He um, did the rescue. Um, he was very highly regarded. And uh, the selection committee, you know, we, you know, we got John came to the rescue. Happy to have him. Um, he was... Uh, uh, very, he was extremely strong. Uh, he was a power lifter, not a bodybuilder, but a power lifter. You know, he wasn't very tall, but he was broad and um, real, real strong, real, real you know, fit guy, um, ate real healthy. Uh, he liked his toys. He had uh, a really nice boat that he would put in on the Cape Cod Canal. Him and Brian Carroll, his uh, partner. Well, fishing buddies, you know, they put the put the boat in the canal, fish off the Cape. Um, he had he loved his Holly. Him and Brian were riding buddies. He had a beautiful truck, and all his stuff was like meticulously maintained. You know, he did everything the right way, um, the way he did, you know, personal life, and the way he like checked the truck when he was a driver. He was on the dive team. Him and Brian. Um, Put all their dive certs together, and um, he was, you know, tech. He was good, really good tech rescue guy. 
Uh, a lot of the younger guys in the house looked up to him because uh, he knew a lot of stuff. You know, he was one of those guys who worked construction on the side. He knew how to fix things. He knew a lot about bikes and cars and trucks and, you know, boats. So uh, just a really, really good guy. He's really, really missed. Oh, two of his sons are now um, on the job, too, which is John and, yeah, yeah. John and um, Mike, his two oldest. Outstanding. Thanks for that overview. Uh, sounds like a great guy. So tell us about the day of the incident. What happened uh, that day? How did that start? So. Um, back then we were um, working uh, two 10 hour days, a day off, two 14 hour nights. And uh, that was our first night tour. And, um, you know, we used to go in at, you know, since they've gone to 24s, but um, we would start our shift at, you know, five o'clock. Um, go to seven in the morning and, you know, you always hear it was a typical, typical shift. I remember it was um, fairly quiet. Uh, we we're in a big house. It was two engines, a ladder, heavy rescue. Um, it was, it was quiet. Even like the engines that are normally running were pretty quiet. And, um, it was real quiet after like 10 o'clock. And then at like 4.20 in the, in the morning, the, um, the box came in. But um, before I get into the fire, uh, I got to talk about the station a little bit. Um, the Franklin Street Station, which houses Engine 6, Engine 12, Ladder 1, Rescue 1, is was built on the site of the Worcester Cold Storage Fire, where we lost six guys in uh, 99. Uh, a little bit controversial at first. A lot of people said, oh, we shouldn't. But it's, it's actually a great place to have a firehouse. Um, you know, we maintain the grounds, have a nice memorial there and stuff. <clears throat> but the point is, we all respond, at, you know, reported fire in that Engine 12's district or Engine 6's district. We all go together. And Engine, uh, and one of our other three company houses, South Division, is about the same distance away on the other side of Vernon Hill, uh, engine two, engine 13, um, ladder three and car four. So we all kind of got there at the same time, you know, the, the responses, four engines, two ladders, rescue, a writ company, which is a third alarm ladder and the chief. So in that neighborhood, ton of resources get in get there within like two or three minutes um uh, the other thing um i gotta look at my notes because like, i have crs oh the building i want i gotta talk about the building a little bit before we get into the fire um worcester's a city of three deckers uh, there's a ton of them and, you know, for the people that aren't familiar with Three Deck is New England, the Northeast, the big wood frame buildings, um, wide open front porches, wide open back porches, balloon frame, uh, like wide open pipe chases. Um, they're old. Uh, this particular building was built in 1890. Dimensions were 28 by 50. Um, this had some unusual traits to it, uh, which I can probably talk about a little later. Um, but they're basically big, giant wooden frames that, you know, once they get going, they really, they, they burn like hell. But we were really good at fighting three deck fires because that was like a bread and butter fire. So um, the night of the fire, well, the morning of the fire, uh, the box came in and, um, the neighborhood, Vernon Hill, very hilly neighborhood. Uh, the whole city has a bunch of hills. Uh, the houses are pretty close together. So the you know three stories, an apartment on each floor. They all have a very similar layout. Um, so as soon as we, you know we, we're gearing up and getting on the on the trucks and heading up and fire alarm says, yeah, we got a report from the medics, and Ian, if you can show with the, the neighborhood. Um, where the fire building was compared to the where the um, EMS house was, 
that black, the black uh, roof, that was 49 Arlington Street where the fire was and that brick building was the old engine 12 ladder fires house. And um, when they built the Franklin Street station, they moved companies around and that station got taken over by uh, EMS. Um, the fire department in Worcester does not run EMS. It's run by a teaching hospital. So Worcester EMS, they're all paramedics. They're really, really good. They were running out of that old firehouse that night and they smelled smoke. And those guys don't spend a lot of time in their bunks. They run all night. So 4.20 in the morning, they smelled smoke. Um, they checked out, you know, their, their building, you know, where's this smoke coming from? And then somebody looked out and saw this three-decker <clears throat> going really good. And they called it in. They called 911 and they were like, yeah, we got a heavy fire in the back, um, second, third floor. So they went down on foot and they went in and there was people in there. So, you know, we're, we're getting this information as we're rolling. We're like, okay, we got work. So we show up, engine 12 gets there first and they're reporting heavy, heavy fire on the uh, Charlie side. And we come walk, we all, you know, we don't rescue company, heavy rescue. We don't, you know, carry hose or ladders. So we try to stay out of the way. We park down on the corner of Dorchester Street and we're walking up and it's like, yeah, we got, we got, you know, heavy fire. And typically what we try to do on the rescue is um, you know, on a three-decker fire, if say the fire is on a second floor, one team will go up the first and it's all kind of, depending on conditions, but like ideally, it's like, okay, fire on the second floor, team one will go up the first floor, go a primary on the second floor, team two will go up the back, team one will go up the front, team two will go up the back, and they'll search above the fire, and then we'll kind of switch. You know, team one will go front to back, second floor, team two will go back to front, third floor, and then team one will go up, team two will come down, and kind of try to do a secondary. Doesn't always work that way. So we got there, took one look down the Delta side, and I said, we're never gonna make the back stairs. Too much fire. <clears throat> and plus I, I saw the medic, he was on the on the sidewalk, and he said, Yeah, we gotta report somebody's still up there. And uh, I knew the guy, you know, and he said, All right, we're all gonna go to the second floor. So, and um, commanding on the rescue is six firefighters and an officer, which very, very rare we have a full complement of guys. So um, between vacations and shipping guys around and sick leave and military leave and stuff like that, um, we very rarely have a full crew. That night there was five firefighters and myself. And my other guy, Lincoln, was detailed to engine six for the night. So the whole rescue group four was working, but Lincoln, Lincoln wasn't on the truck. And Lincoln and John were big, big buddies. They had transferred from engine seven together on the same day. They worked together for years. So um, <clears throat> every, every shift, I have to look at who, who I have for manpower and make teams. So I have, um, you know, there's partners. All the firefighters have a partner. Me being the officer, I didn't have a partner. So whoever, and we don't have a chauffeur. We have, we rotate. Everyone drives on a rotation. So whoever's driving that tour, his partner is my partner for that shift. But seeing we had six, six people on a truck, myself, five firefighters, the driver stays with the truck initially. So I ended up making two teams. Team one was me, Kenny was my senior man, and Dave. There was another Dave driving. Team two was John and Brian, John Davies, Brian Carroll. So we went up to the second floor and I said, Brian and no, John, John, Brian, you guys go left, we'll go right. And almost immediately, it was like, wow, something weird about this layout. Um, very, very, very uncommon 
layout for a typical three deck though. Do you have that um, shot of the layout, uh, Ian? I do. Okay, so this was really different. Um, typically where the, the front porches are, uh, the, the, in the stairway, the, the bedrooms are stacked up behind those. It'd be like bedroom A, bathroom, bedroom B, bedroom C would be behind that. And then on the opposite side of the stairs, there'd be, you know, like a sitting room, front room, parlor, depending on how old school you were, then the dining room, then a kitchen, and then storage in the back. And I've been in thousands of these things in there was, you'd never see two bathrooms in a three deck. There's only always only one bathroom. You know, they're very old. Back when they were built, they were, you know, cold water if they had plumbing at all. But um, Kenny and Dave, we went left. And I kind of stayed right in the kitchen bedroom doorway, right in that area with a thermal imager. I said, all right, you guys go search. And... Um, I'll watch you. And Dave went into the bathroom. I'm like, wow, what the? He's like, I got a bathroom. Well, like, that, why is there a bathroom off the kitchen? Because they're almost 99.9%. .9 they're right off the hallway. Um, so we're like, this is really weird. Anyhow, we did, we did the best we could. And we ended up going. John and Brian went right. And they searched that whole area into the kitchen into the dining area and we got to the back and it was heavy, heavy fire. So <clears throat> we backed out, we searched and we did get to the other bathroom and bedroom B, but um, the, you know, there was no, we could not get to that bedroom C. So we backed out, went to the porch and I saw it by the other Dave, my driver was out front of the building and he had a bunch of spare bottles staged across the street. And I told Kenny, I said, Kenny, I'm going to go join Dave and we're going to go to the first floor. You guys go to the third floor. And, and Kenny, um, and you know, one thing about this is these rescue guys are used to operating on their own. You know, I mean, it's not like an engine company way. Okay, you get three or four guys, one guy's on a pump. The rest of the crew stays together. It's a little different now. So I had I had no problem saying, you know, you guys go do it because that's what we did all the time. And they were all really experienced, great crew. So um, I kind of I said, all right, myself and Dave Sachs, Dave S will be team one. Kenny, you and Dave, I mean, um, I, re I redesignated all the teams. <clears throat> I went down to the first floor. Those guys went to the third floor. Platter one was on the third floor. They started searching up there. Um, fire conditions up there were way worse. It was going like hell in the attic. Now the attic's wide open. Um, so I went to the first floor with Dave and it wasn't too bad. We made it all the way to the back, but the back porches were going in, in order to get to the basement. I wanted to shut off the gas. Um, the apartments were empty, but you never know, you know, sometimes they, and, and, and a meter was in the basement and, uh, but we couldn't make the basement. So the chief pulled everybody at that point, there was conditions were getting worse, pulled everybody out of the second and third floor. So we all met on the first floor and we, we were like, I was kind of reassigning everybody again because our crews got all mixed up. So um, Lincoln, who was on engine six, was Kenny's partner. So I said, all right, Kenny, you're with me. We're team one. Dave and Dave, I mean, um, John and, and Brian, team two. Dave and Dave, you're team three. And it all goes by seniority and stuff. So at that point, um, the chief pulled everyone out of the building. So, all right, started setting up big lines. We went across the street, changed our bottles out, kind of just staged in there. You know, a lot of pipes are getting set up. Um, the, the fire's really going on the third floor in the attic. 
in the back in the first and second floor. You know, two and a half deck guns, ladder pipes. And we're standing there. And, the, you know, the chiefs, I said, he said, you guys just stage here. So there we are, six of us, just kind of standing by. We all got new bottles. And there's this guy, you know, pacing up and down the street, this kind of sketchy looking guy. And he was saying, my buddy's still up there. My buddy's still up there. So we were over on the corner of like the, like the A, B side. And I said, you know, where was he? And he goes, that last window on the second floor, but on the other side. I said, all right. So we walked over to the A, Alpha Delta side. I said, show me. Yeah, right there, the window in that bedroom C. That's where he was pointing. I'm like, oh man, I said, that's the only room we didn't make. So I'm thinking, all right, the guy's up there. He's in really bad shape, but you know. So I went over to the uh, command post and the, the chief and the safety chief were there. And I said, hey, this guy said his, and I, oh, one thing I did that I grabbed Kenny, who was, I said, Kenny, interview this guy. I want to make sure he's giving you the same information he just gave me. So Kenny was talking to him. I'm talking to the chief. She's like, what do you think? I'm like, well, we were, we're up there once already. There's no furniture. I know the layout. We should be able to get in and out. We'll just go right to that one bedroom because we, we searched the rest of the place. And he said, all right, you're going to need an engine company to back you up. I said, well, chief, I said, there's six of us. His line's already up there. Um, I think we can, we can handle it. No, 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 you need an engine company. And the chief was working swap. He wasn't our regular South End chief. But I had known the guy for years. We worked out of the same house. He was a great guy, a real good chief. Um, so he called engine two you know, on the radio. Oh, what's your location? And we're like, oh, where, where um, we're grabbing a hydrant with feed and line of one. I had engine 12, what's the location? We're helping engine, engine two. I was like, I don't need two engine companies, you know, taking a hydrant. So engine 12, two's like, okay, we'll, we'll take it. We'll back up the rescue. While all this is going on, all my guys are standing at the bottom of the stairs, except for me and Kenny. Me and Kenny were at the command post. And, you know, like firefighters, everything's by seniority. John was out of those. Kenny was senior, but he was with me. John, then Brian, John and Brian were like, at the bottom of the stairs, they're on the sidewalk. And then two Daves, you know, waiting to go. They're waiting to go. They're like chomping at the bit. And um, finally got the okay, but we had to wait for the engine companies, which I was like, you know, chief. But, you know, he's a chief. I'm a, I'm a lieutenant. So I came up. I said, yeah. And then engine two came up. All right, I can't remember if it was engine two or engine 12. One of the engine companies came up. I'm like, all right, let's go. So single file, we go up the stairs. There's a set of stairs on the exterior, very hilly neighborhood. So you go up like four or five stairs, a little walkway, three or four stairs to a porch, and then you head in. So it was John, Brian, Dave, Dave, me, and Kenny. And then... Um, Right when me and Kenny were heading in, some fascia dropped from the third floor. It was still burning in the attic pretty good. So we stopped. Everybody else had a little bit of a head start on us. So we got up to that sitting room area. And we all, and the conditions weren't bad at all. Like we were, it was low heat, low smoke. But in the back, it was, you know, a little bit you know, more heat, more smoke. But we kind of like duck walked through the sitting area, through the kitchen. And we were right at that area there by that stove. And, and I remember John saying, we'll go right. And Dave, the senior Dave, said, all right, we'll go left. I said, Kenny, we'll stay here and just kind of monitor him because it's you know not a very big area. And they were just going to check that one little bedroom. And Brian said to John, right when they were entering the room, he said, John, I got the imager. I'm going to go first. And... I never micromanage my guys. There's a million ways to search. Some guys, you know, use the imager in the rear. Some guys take it in the front. These guys were all really good. I let them work it out. Um, so they said, all right. So it was Brian and John going down that 
right hand wall on the exterior, the D side, and Dave and Dave going along the left. Well, Kenny and I were in the doorway, and there was a catastrophic collapse like, no warning, no nothing, no creaking, no all of a sudden, boom. We were all like, what the hell was that? All of a sudden, the visibility went to zero. We all went to our knees. Um, and you couldn't see it. You couldn't see a thing. Engine 12 guys and engine two guys were behind us, and there was a lot of confusion. There was a couple of maydays. I didn't give a mayday. I was just trying to find my, my guys. I had Kenny. We looked in. So the, so things cleared out a little bit and, and there was a lean to collapse right in front of us. And all we could see was the bottom of the third floor floor joist or doing a lean to. And I could see a couple guys in that. Um, I started breaching the wall just to the left of where like that range is. Yep. Right in there. Those, there was no contact there. And um, Kenny went right into the collapse and pulled out Dave, Ryan, and uh, Lieutenant Chesna from Engine 12. He dove right into the collapse. He's a big giant guy. And he pulled out Dave Sachs and they were like stunned. <clears throat> so now I'm like, all right, I'm counting, counting heads. There's a lot of confusion. I said, everyone to the front porch. Um, visibility was still pretty bad. I could see a, I saw a helmet in the collapse. And I'm like, oh, that's John Davies' helmet. Cause he had one of those little um, like lights that you mount to the side. I'm like, all right, that's John's helmet. And we got out towards that sitting area and I got two guys and one of them had a, no helmet on. I'm like, all right, that's John. And that must be John and Brian. We got out on the porch, no John and Brian. And everyone, the guy's like, everyone's out, everyone's out. I'm like, they're not out until I, I have my hands on them. So um, there was a, a kid, a young kid on engine 12. Um, we had a pack tracker, a Scott pack tracker that we had only had him for a short time. And we're still not, not just me, uh, the rescue, but the department, safety, training, we're all trying to figure out how we're going to, um, are we going to put this on the rescue? We're going to put it in the car. We're going to put it with the safety officer. Is the rescue officer going to have it? Is the chief's um, aide, is command tech going to have it? It was nothing was set in stone. So we used to just leave it on the front bumper of the rescue. So, because, you know, if we left it in a compartment and somebody was looking for it that wasn't familiar with the truck, they'd never find it. So, I sent this, this this young kid out. I said, go get the pack tracker off of um, the, the rescue and bring it up here. And in the meantime, the whole like D side of the building was blown out right back towards that bedroom C. And engine 13 was out there on the exterior and they heard a pass device. And right when about that time, um, we were standing in that area by the range and um, we had the pack tracker and Kenny was, you know, um, doing a sweep with it. And, you know, it's like beep, 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 beep. And he started pointing it down. It was going beep, 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 beep. Like, oh, okay, they're below us. So we all, we head down to the first floor. And um, we found John right around, this, and the engine 13 came in through that blown out D side and they got to him before we did. And, First, we didn't know who it was, but then you can ID um, the SCBA through the pack track, and we're like, all right, that's John. And there was all kinds of roofing, you know, like heavy timbers on his shoulders. He was like in a, we didn't know it at the time, but he was like in a sitting position with, um, we couldn't see his head. We just see the back and his um, cylinder. And uh, we started digging and, um, you know, when I did a lot of training, I used to teach a lot of tech rescue stuff. I would teach, you know, collapse, teach ropes, teach combined space. And I always talk about plan A, plan plan B. Well, in the moment, my plan B and C and D went right out the window. Because in my mind's eye, 
I saw Brian, you know, kind of duck walking down that, that um, right hand wall, and John was right behind him. And I'm like, all right, we got John. Brian's going to be right in front of him. So we started digging. Um, we're bringing in chainsaws, but they kept stalling out. We, so we start using sawzalls. We're bringing in um, airbags, struts, um, rams. You know, we're trying all kinds of stuff. The problem was there was so much loose debris on the bottom that you know we we put a piece of plywood down an airbag and we weren't lifting. We were pushing everything down because it was soft. And um, this captain arrived, he was filling in on car three and he was like a tech rescue guru, um, great guy, worked on him for years. And he took over as like rescue um, command on the interior. And that gave me great comfort and Lincoln who was on engine six that day. It was a very small area to work. Lincoln and one of our tech rescue train guys from Ladder One were deep in this like little void trying to get John out. The rest of us were just kind of doing support stuff and they dispatched um, Special Ops One, uh, engine five, Ladder Four with the, the collapse. Well, it's not really a collapse truck. It's multiple disciplines. Um, collapse, rescue, I mean, uh, ropes, trench, all that stuff. They were really, really good um, crew, really good lieutenant. Um, they, they arrived and he had the presence of mind to go to plan B. And this old three-decker had a um, brick foundation, very small basement window in the front. And he got a couple of guys, they popped a bunch of bricks out and he entered the basement by himself. And there was no fire or anything down there. It was, he could, didn't even have to go on air. And he located Brian in the basement and he was completely, completely um, encapsulated in debris. Um, he said when the collapse occurred, it, you know, it turned into a lean-to. So the second floor, the floor they were on, he said it was like a slide. He slid, ended up in the basement. John slid behind him. Everything landed on him, but Brian made it to the basement before he got caught up in the collapse. And John made it to the first floor and he got more of the heavy stuff. So, you know, we had, we had, when we found John's, we cleared his bottle. Um, I said, what's his, what's his gauge at? They're like, it's full. And I'm like, oh man, that's not good because I knew we just filled, I'm like the guy's not breathing. So it was very difficult for me, but I'm like, all right, we gotta go to the basement, get Brian. And the fact that Captain Dolan was in charge and Lincoln, I'm like, and Lincoln was a um, combat veteran. He did a bunch of two, two tours in Iraq and tour Afghanistan. And, I said, there's no way Lincoln's going to leave John. So it was really hard to do, but I, we left him, uh, went to the basement. So it was myself, Griff, the guy from Engine 5, Kenny, my senior Dave, and a couple guys from Lot of One. And Brian, you couldn't even, you could, we couldn't see him at first. We could hear him. And we started digging them out and we had to shore because the guys were working above us. So we bring a bunch of parrot and the guys from ladder four were awesome. And one of my Dave's, they stayed at the window. And one of the ladder one guys was like our runner. He said, all right, we need a you know 72 inch strut with a swivel and a saddle. And boom, we have in our hands. We would, and myself. Dave and the lieutenant from Ladder One were shoring. Kenny and Griff were cutting. We had a bunch of cold sawzalls down there. And we slowly dug Brian out. Um, he was he was unbelievable. I I, I would not have survived um, what he what he went through. He was on the dive team, and I think that went a long way into. Um, he was using all these breathing techniques, and at one point, is he ran out of air but he could just move one finger up and break the seal. Um, you know, it was, it was a really tough spot. Um, 
He had a lot of pressure on his hip. Uh, at one point, his mask started filling up with water, and he was just able to break the seal and drain the water. And it took us quite a while. I lost track of time. I think it was around 40 minutes or something like that. But we finally got him out. And, um, you know, they, they had gotten John out. And it was a recovery. We were pretty well aware of that. But Brian was a, you know, a rescue. He was like, I'm walking out of here. Well, like, you know, like, hell you are. And we got him in a basket and, you know, got him out of there. And, um, yeah, and that was that was that. You know, went back to the truck. I said, "Everybody, back to the truck." I said, "You too, Lincoln." And the captain of uh, Engine Six was like, "He's with me." I'm like, "No, just you know, give us give us ten minutes." So we went to the back of the rescue. And we we're just sitting there, and we we're all like stunned. We just worked, you know, worked our asses off. And uh, I said, "All right, let's just take a little blow here." And um, an off-duty chief came up who I had gone to drill school with, and he was like, Joe, you you gotta go to the hospital. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, you gotta tell Brian. He doesn't know. I'm like, oh, you're right. So off I went to the hospital. And Brian was, you know, it was a it was crazy in the emergency room. And and now, like, you know, Brian's like, how's John? I'm like, he didn't make it. I was like, oh, it's terrible. But oh, uh, you know, <clears throat> before we leave this slide, in, there's one thing I want to point out. Right in that middle, there's like a wall, like a bearing wall, the way these things are built, that's a continuous bearing wall. So, you know, there's a in the bottom of the basement, there'll be a, a beam, bearing wall above that. The floor joist will sit on that bearing wall from, you know, all the way up to the roof. But we found out later that there was a, something different about this house that led to the collapse. I just want to point out, you know, on this is the layout. But if, if uh, when we get to the basement, I'll, we can kind of point out what uh, was one of the factors in the collapse. All right, front of the structure. So. Yeah, um, typical three decker, um, but that that stairway on the right, on the on the from the sidewalk. Um, very hilly neighborhood, you know, you can see the grade. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of people are like, why'd you go back in that building? Um, the way these things burn, um, I've been, I don't know how many hundreds of three-decker fires we'd go to, we, the fire would be, you know, knocked down. Um, it'd be going up in the attic, the roof would collapse, it would burn, and, but you know, once we had the, the big stuff knocked down, we'd go back in and pull ceilings, and you know, we, they didn't they didn't fall down like that. We would we would joke around, said you know how to go. Oh, we burned the roof off of that one. Oh, we burned the three, third floor off of that one. But the rest of the building's still there, and there's a bunch of them in the city that you know the owner decided, all right, they're gonna rebuild, but they're just gonna put a roof on, and now it's a two family. It's not a it's not a three family. It's it's two stories. You know they there's tons of them like that and so we were you know it was like no big deal going back in there um, you know the heavy fire was knocked down but uh this one was a little different this is the layout and where everything was you were talking about yeah this was just kind of where we were when um the collapse occurred you know the victim and the injured firefighter John, Brian was in the front, but he they were both on the wall. You know, they're doing really basic uh, rescue. And they were just going to um, go right to that back bedroom and get in and out. And um, Dave and Dave, those were the guys in the corner, they they were on like a little ledge. Um, there's another video, um, another photo later, like, they were really, they were really close to getting, you know, going down too. Um, and Kenny and I were um, right at the doorway, and then engine twelve was behind us, and engine two was, you know, they were just kind of hanging out, you know, no big deal. They, they had a line up there and just kind of looking around and making sure there was no fire behind us or anything. But 
all, there was still fire above us, but nothing really right there. Yeah, so that's that's the back of the building after they you know de delay de de it. Um, that second floor, that that doorway there on the second floor, that's where Kenny and I were. That is the breach where I started going through the wall. In the very corner, that's where Dave and Dave were. And we got to those, you know, and we get to them a little pretty quick. And it was only like an 18 inch like shelf before where that second floor collapsed down. And Kenny, I mean, uh, John and Brian were on that floor and that's where they slid into the basement. Um, of course, you know, we couldn't see that because it was the third floor was doing the same thing, like right in front of us. That, yeah, the third floor uh, collapsed down as, into a lean-to right in front of us. So we couldn't really see any of that from the interior. Yeah, so that's, that's where um, John and Brian ended up. John was right there covered with, he was basically covered with the third floor on the roof. And Brian was down below in a basement covered with like the first floor and all tons of debris. There was pipes, there was wiring. There was, I think there was a bed frame. I'm not really sure where it came from. It might've been on the second floor, but it might've been in that room we never got to. But um, it was a lot of small stuff. But one thing to point out is um, it's hard to see, but that carrying beam I talked about in the basement, it usually goes from A, A side to Charlie side was split. If you can kind of line up the, the columns, there was that section and then it jogged over. And there was um, like the, the front two thirds were like um, 14 on center, like the joist, but then it jogged over. Um, so and that's exactly where the, um, the collapse occurred. So I don't, I don't know if they did some kind of weird renovations, but it was way different than what we usually see in these buildings. <clears throat> and the other thing was the um, foundation. Um, there's a lot of these buildings have field stone foundations to grade, you know, just big, just rocks and uh, mortared in there. And then above grade, it's brick, because it looks nicer from the exterior. But they weren't maintained. So all the um, water was all old and crumbly, and they needed to be repointed, and they never, never did. And it had been wet um, for, you know, central Massachusetts in, in December. We had, had quite a bit of rain, so there was, the ground was kind of saturated. It's usually frozen solid, and it was windy. Oh, the other thing um, was different about this building is a lot of these three deckers, the base, the um, foundation ends at the like the the delta wall, and then the porches. Could you go back to that floor plan? Uh, which which one? The, just the regular floor plan. The one. Yep. Okay. So. This foundation extended all the way to the very, very back where it says side C. And on most of these three deckers, the foundation would only go to where that wall where it says bedroom B and bedroom C. And the back porches would be attached almost like a deck. So they would have, you know, columns going to they weren't really even really good footings. It was surprised that the thing stayed up. So we'd have fires where the back porches would be going and they'd collapse, but the rest of the building wouldn't because it was just like a deck burning off of a, a house. But this one, the foundation extended all the way back to the seaside and that also contributed to the collapse. And the collapse occurred right, like that thing that's, where the, where the range is, and is that, that, that's a polyheater. Um, and that's where the collapse occurred, right there. 
Um, can you go to that one that's showing? Um, okay, that one right there. Oh, go back one more. Okay, um, right in that corner where I said Dave and Dave were, there was, it's, it's really hard to see in there, but right next to the breach, there's a, there's a vent pipe right there. That's a vent pipe. And that was going to a power heater. So Dave and Dave, when they were doing their left-hand search, they went around that power heater and then back on the wall. If it, if it happened like literally seconds earlier, they would have slid down too. You know, I mean, that's how that's how things go. Um, you know, and, and when I I spent a little time like what if thing, not not a lot, just a little bit. And I said, you know, what if the chief let us in? Just let us just let us go. You know, we didn't need we didn't need an energy company backing us up. We would have been in and out. But then I'm like, you know what? You can't do that because we could have had more guys deeper in the building. And more guys would have got caught in the collapse. So, you know, you can't, what if, what if, what if, so. I'm trying to think there's anything else about the fire. Um, I don't think so. We kind of covered most of it. Oh yeah, that's that's what the conditions look like when we were actually um, in there. Um, you know, we were, this was afterwards, but that's basically what it looked like. We were under all that crap, trying to find those guys. Um, Brian was, you know, way down, way down below that. He was like down in the basement. John was right about where, the, um, where your cursor is, but Brian was down underneath that. So it was it was pretty tough conditions, you know. It was still pouring, you know, there was still pouring a ton of water on the thing. And it was, we had to deal with that too, so. Still active fire during the race uh, up in the attic and that that. I'm sorry. Still active fire up in the attic while you're all doing the rescue and recovery. Yeah, yeah, and this kind of coming down kind of helped them get to it. You know, I mean, right. I, of course, I didn't know any of this was going on, but um, guys on the exterior said, "Yeah, once once the building, the back of the building came down, we could get pretty good access at the attic because a lot of times, you know, the roof will kind of come down, but um, it's kind of just sitting on the third floor and, and it's on the fires underneath all the shingles. A lot of these buildings have shingles with old slate roofs under them. They used to shingle right over the slate roof. So, you know, take the fire a long, long time to get through the roof. And, um, you know, you just be there forever trying to put it out. That's another reason why we'd send guys back inside and they'd pull ceilings and get it from the interior. Because a lot of them didn't have floors on the third floor. Um, I mean, in the attic, it would just be open floor joists. So you could just pull the ceiling and be right, you know, get a line right up into the attic. Okay. Yeah, that, that was next morning. You know. And, you know, I, I was, I remember talking to the safety captain, or the safety chief, who was a really good friend of mine. And I had tons of experience, you know, he ended up retiring like with like 38 years on the job. And <clears throat> he did everything, you know, company officer training, rescue captain for a while, district chief. And uh, he, I said, should we have gone back in that building? And he goes, I was a safety chief. I could have stopped you. I could have, you know, safety separate from operations. And he goes, I never thought, saw this coming. And a lot of old time, Firefighters that were real experienced said the same thing. You know, never saw it coming, never saw it coming. And never saw a three-decker act like this. It was really unusual. And one thing that I, I don't think we have a picture of it, but the, the, the foundation almost like peeled over um, because of the conditions of the brick. It just, you know, it, there were so many factors that just led to this that you know, we didn't see coming. Thanks for the detailed explanation of, of how that went down. Anything you want to add about what you personally were experiencing as this unfolds from you know the incident as you go in through the collapse and that? Can you repeat that, Ian? 
What's your personally experience? You know, you talked about the, the tactics and how you did business, but personally, any any emotions you're experiencing as you go make the entry and then the collapse and through that? So. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, everything was, you know, I hate to say routine. It was, yeah, we had, we had a really good work with fire. Um, um, but just been to a million of them like that. You know, like I said, we're really good at three deck of fires. Um, you know, we, I got a, when, when John and Brian were missing, I, I almost had a little bit of disbelief. Um, you know, and as I know, we, we had that video, but they took it down. But um, there was one, you know, they say, don't ever say somebody's name on the air. But I did, you know, I was just like, rescue to team two Davies location. I remember saying that, but I was just like, I wanted, you know, and plus the other, one of the reasons I did that is because we had changed like three times change the teams, you know, just because of the way things played out. But, um, you know, when we, when we, when he went missing, when John went missing and Brian went missing, and then when we, I had to leave John, uh, that was really hard, um, very difficult. But like I said, the captain and Lincoln, the fact that, you know, I'm like, they're going to get him out, you know, there's absolutely no way they, they're going to, you know, fail. So, but, you know, firefighters are funny, you know, we're even like going into the basement. Um, Kenny went in before me and I'm trying to get down in there and there was a bat, a bat of um, insulation. And I, I thought it was a wall. I went and I was leaning on it and I ended up falling into the basement and landed on top of Kenny. And, you know, we, this was like my worst, um, you know, like I said, I worked a cold storage fire and, you know, we lost six guys, but they weren't my guys, you know? Um, and I landed on Kenny and we were like joking about it, you know? I mean, that's kind of how you deal with stuff in the, in the moment, you know? But uh, I was so busy. I just didn't have a lot of other, and Brian was unbelievable. He was like cracking jokes and, you know, this guy's like, it almost on the verge of death and he's like making us laugh, you know? Right. But, one of the questions came up, you mentioned that, uh, you know, one of the, the reasons you went to bedroom C was there was uh, uh, somebody that told you that there was somebody in there. Did you ever find, was there a civilian casualty? Was there anything to that? No, no. He, I guess he was up there with this guy, but, he got out on his own and took off and there was squatters the place was vacant. Um, you know, um, same thing happened to gold storage fire, you know, we were both people in there and, you know, you, you do your best, you know, you don't really, you can't really ignore it. Absolutely. Been a little over 10 years since, you, since the incident, you know, what are some key points you want firefighters to know about this incident, some lessons learned? So. Well, one thing, I started going personally was um, going to um, every, every time I went to like a gas call or a CO call, I would go to the basement, especially the three decker. A lot of times you could tell if it's a, you know, a single family home or it's a little bit newer, it's a poured concrete foundation. But um, I would, um, I would go to the basement. You know, we got to go to the basement anyhow, but I wanted to see the, how the foundation was stuff you don't really think about like foundations and carrying beams and columns and stuff like that. I, I started looking at those a little bit different. Um, you know, just, and, and we started sharing information a little bit better um, with the other groups. You know, if somebody saw something weird, you know, I'd, I'd pass it on to the other rescue offices. And, you know, I was just I wanted to remember John, too, you know. Was there anything in the agency, any significant changes for the Worcester Fire Department for, for, as a result of this? Well, you know, this was so, this was like, it wasn't like um, 
it was a uh, he ran out of air or uh, he got disoriented. Well, he was he did everything right, you know. And um, that was like I don't carry a ton of guilt because I don't think we did anything wrong. Um, so there wasn't a lot of oh we have to change this we have to change that. One thing that uh, the department did was try to work better with the buildings department because there was all kinds of violations that they were issuing for years on this property. And there's a ton of them, you know, it's an old city. So they started um, passing it on to the fire department, the fire prevention. And um, we just started getting iPads a couple we didn't we didn't have computers on the on the trucks but then um i retired in 2018 probably around 2016 they put they started putting ipads on the trucks and um it was they were they were on the rescue a couple engine companies the cars but you know i'm kind of old school if i don't have my glasses i can't even read the thing so but they started putting a lot of information on these properties. And I guess now like they're on every company and the software is like way better. So stuff will come up, you know? I mean, you know, <clears throat> it's hard to be like, okay, I gotta get, get up, I gotta get my, you know, my tank ready. I got, oh, I gotta check the computer while I run route. But, you know, I think now like maybe the chief's aid um, can do it or the safety, you know, the safety captain or whatever. Things have changed since I left. They went to MSAs. Um, so I don't know how much of um, they've kept that going, but that was the plan anyhow. Great. Have that stuff accessible right on the fire ground. What, uh, you know, we talked about experience the day of the incident, weeks, months afterwards, anything significant you experienced in, in, in that time after this? Um, you know, we we had gotten called in like that very next day you know, to do a debriefing with, it was more like a interview with the, um, the police and arson investigation because there's a suspected arson. Um, so, okay, we've got to do that. But then, you know, they start doing SISM, which is important, but I think in my experience, um, I've had to do it a couple times. Sometimes they do it too early um, or in the wrong setting. Like um, we, like the next night, I was supposed to go to work. The another group volunteered to cover a shift, so I didn't go to work. I had three days off and then, you know, we had time off of the funeral and stuff like that. So it wasn't like, it was like over a week before the whole crew, the whole house went back to work and we're like, all right, let's have a sit down. And at the time, um, well, you know, we were just going to have our own little group and, and um, these guys showed up from some they weren't Worcester guys. They weren't even, they were, I don't know. They meant well, but they just timed it wrong. You know, we were like, we're not ready to do this. And they were, the captain you know, kind of threw him out. He was like, we haven't even talked amongst ourselves yet. When the time's right, it's absolutely essential, but it's going to be the right time. And then I, I, um, I waited too long after that to get help. Um, I waited way too long. I have, four brothers, um, two lieutenants in the police department. My other brother's a lieutenant in the fire department. And we kid around and said, yeah, my, my oldest, he's a smart one. He's a plumber. But um, I talked to them a lot. You know, it took me years to realize, what do they know? <laughs> you know they're not trained, you know. Um, and my, my brother, who's a firefighter, was way more, he got it. My brothers out of cops really kind of didn't, you know, but anyhow, I took, it took me a long time to finally get some professional help. Right. I, I recommend doing that sooner rather than later. You just right into to the next question. What advice you give to officers and firefighters? Obviously one is get help sooner. 
Anything else? Absolutely. Use use the resources. You know, um, the guys, a different SISM group did come in afterwards, and it was great. Right. You know, that was great. But it was like, but it wasn't a week later. It was like maybe a month later, and that was awesome. We had a great session. Um, you know, EAP if you need it. Um, Peer, the you know the the, the Peer company office of PIS is fantastic, fantastic. I'm so glad I got involved in that. Um, there's a place in Massachusetts that's unbelievable. It's called Onsite Academy, and um, it's out in the middle of the woods in North Central Massachusetts. And it's police, fire, military, EMS, like people that have post traumatic stress, and it's free. You go out there, you can go for a day, you can go for three days, you can go for a week, and they help a ton of people. And I can't believe how many guys have started using it. That the that stigma is gone of you know, just get back on a truck. You know what I mean? It's people people realize and you know mental health is a real thing. So I uh, it took me way too long to do it. Uh, so talk to people. It helps this this helps me tremendously believe it or not a um, couple reasons it helps me get stuff off my chest it helps me remember john and you know brian like brian brian's my hero you know? so just thank you for this opportunity but yeah I, that's my, be my biggest advice is talk to people get help even if, even if you think you don't need it just talk All right, we got a, a video to show. We'll uh, share the screen here. Here, we just got a little tribute to, to Firefighter Davies. Yeah, that's the memorial t shirt we came up with. Yep. Raised, raised a ton of money. And they made the funeral. So. That's Brian Carroll carrying John's. Well, actually, it's not John's helmet. His was taken over by the, the DA's office for evidence. Right. And then we have uh, about a year later, uh, Brian Carroll, uh, obviously the firefighter that was trapped with, with uh, firefighter Davies, uh, did a, a video, and we got that to show you real quick here. I definitely feel different. You know, I look at things differently. Um, you know, I kind of wonder half the time why I'm still here and then what am I supposed to be doing? Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? So it's always a question. Hasn't been easy, <clears throat> definitely. I've had some other things lately that, that has been bringing that uh, feeling back of being trapped and you know, that being pinned down, it's, it's a, horrible feeling you know so I've had a couple brushes with that with a few things that I've been doing but I'm I just think it's because of this week because I've had to bring everything to come back you know and uh, but I mean I'm, I'm pushing through and I haven't been back up to the site yet so I'm sure December 8th is going to be a little difficult for me going up there you know since I haven't been back up and I really didn't plan on going back up but I'm gonna do it I th think I need to you know, everybody go, I was, I was in on during the 99 thing and went through it, that whole thing, you know, so I know what that experience was like. Um, that hurt a lot. One of the kids was in my class and uh, I knew the other guys, I had worked with them on the rescue. And that was obviously a giant loss for all of us here, you know, and it went, I mean, it went on for years that we felt that, you know, and it's still not over. Actually, tomorrow's December 3rd, we'll all be down here tomorrow night at 618, standing out front waiting for them to ring the bell again. You know, we've been doing it for the 13 years now. And um, so, and then to experience this whole thing with it being John and being so personal to me, because John was one of my best friends. You know, we fished together, snowmobiled together, rode motorcycles together. You know, all the fun stuff that I did, a lot of it was with John, uh, especially the boating stuff and the fishing, which, you know, I obviously, we missed this year and it was, you know, all summer long I was thinking about it. But this one was a little bit more personal to me where I, you know, I hurt, I cried during 99. I felt for everybody's family and I felt for everything. This one here really hurt because it was, you know, a great loss to me personally. Um, and, you know, that's what I've taken out of the experience that it was, uh, 
it bothered me a lot. You know, he was a good friend. So it's still, you know, to this day, it still raises questions in my mind. You know, what, you know, like I said, what am I supposed to be doing? And I don't know, am I supposed to be doing something differently? But um, I think, guys, we sent John off well when everything happened, and I think I've, you know, I've taken care of my obligations. So I, you know, I feel good about it. You know, and I, I'm moving on. This this week's hard. It just brought up a lot of memories because everyone asks, you know, how you doing, how's things? So it all comes back. That's pretty amazing video. Pretty strong guy there, Jim. Yeah, um, let me can I just talk about Brian for a minute. He, he was unbelievable. Um, he did come. He came back to work. He had some physical problems, um, almost like the crush syndrome. Um, you know, if you have a trench thing, but it, he had some problems with his kidneys. And I've clear. I talk to Brian all the time. He's my golf partner in the, in the fight department league, and um, he's fine with me talking about him. You know, I'm not talking out of school or anything, but um, he came back and he was doing a job. Um, I know he was struggling, you know, and we did, he was on a dive team and we did have a um, school alert. And um, he was the guy that found, the, you know, it was recovery. Um, I mean, we got there. Um, it was during the day, uh, busy beach in the city, and we got there, you know, pretty quick. We, we found the guy pretty quick, but you know, it was it was in September, so it wasn't like a cold water one, and so it was recovery, and he did it, and uh, but he was he was really struggling, and uh, he had to retire, you know. And he tried, and he did the job for a while, and um, it was just. He just couldn't do it, but he's doing great now. I mean, like I said, he's, he's doing awesome. He, um, I golf with him a ton, and, um, you know, he was another victim, but he's, like I said, he's, he's doing really, really well. I, I, I'm very proud of him. You still on the job? No, he had to retire. He did have to retire, yeah. Yeah, he had to retire. Um, yeah. yeah. Good. Uh, let me just make some comments that have come through the comments. Um, and, and I think you've hit on a couple of these things. You know, this can happen to anybody at any time. Um, got some comments. You know, you're an outstanding fire officer. And this is from some people that worked with you, for you, through you, uh, you know, that you work for. Um, this can happen to anybody. Uh, Benny Dunn took a look at this incident from a building, because obviously when the father building construction and, and, and take a look at that and doesn't understand why the building collapsed as far as normal procedures out of it. Obviously, when you look at it and the beams and the way they were, were done, but there was no reason not to go inside this building. So you can do everything right and things still happen sometimes. And that's an important lesson we get out of a lot of these. these things can go right and still uh, come up, uh, you know, tragic consequences in the long run out of it. So um, can't thank you enough. Uh, Lieutenant Gaffney for, for joining us today. Hugely helpful. Got a you know comments on you know the courage you got to, to go through this to so other people can learn from these incidents and what to go through and that kind of stuff. One thing I failed to mention uh, when I was talking about Joe and his contribution to the, to the foundation uh, back in July, we met in San Antonio to develop this company officer to company officer program that hadn't existed before. Um, and John Sullivan's on with us today. He was kind of the spearheaded this of the need for this program. Uh, thank you, Chief, for, for your efforts in that. Look forward to working with you in the future on that one. And Joe was part of this uh, program with us in San Antonio, helped develop this program. He's one of our peer mentors. Uh, when we have requests for, for company officer, company officer that, that engages with that. So thanks for all your help uh, with that program. I look forward to working with you in, in the future on this. You, you've been a great asset to this. So. Uh, I don't see any other comments or questions. So again, thanks for, for your time, Lieutenant Gaffney, and your, your willingness to share this story. Very powerful. And it's going to have a, a tremendous impact uh, down the road. Can I just, uh, I just remember one thing, Ian. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. This tragedy in Baltimore where we lost you know, two brothers and a sister in a collapse just really hit home with me. And I uh, just want to send out my thought prayers to the families of the, of the brothers and sisters and uh, the Baltimore Fire Department and you know, know what they're going through. Very timely and we, we definitely echo that. Thank you very much. So thanks for joining us today. Um, please next third or the third, the fourth Thursday in February, the 24th at 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Chief Lloyd Crago from the Young, uh, Youngwood, Pennsylvania Fire Department is going to join me and we're going to be talking uh, firefighter Edwin Lance 
um, I'm sorry, Edwin Lance Wetzel, Lance was his, uh, uh, what he went by, was killed by a train during a search and rescue mission. And Chief Gray was going to talk about uh, the same type of thing, the impact on the department, what happened, and the impact on him personally. So hope you can join us then. Then Gaffney, thanks again. Truly appreciate it. And I uh, hope thank everybody you. has a great day. Take yeah, care. Thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Have a good day. So. You too.